good evening to everyone present here. Thank you so much for registering for the ISDM masterclass series. And thank you for now attending this uh, masterclass. As uh, always, I hope you all are safe and staying indoors and keeping yourselves and your community protected. So uh, today's masterclass is by Mr. Ravi Shankar Ayer. And uh, without actually much ado and wasting any more time, I would like to hand over the dais to Mr. Ravi Shankar. Ravi. Thanks, Adil. That was short and sweet. Thank you so much. This is overwhelming, Adil, to see so many participants. And when I was looking at the, uh, the chat window, right, it's like uh, all over the country, in fact, all over the world, people from all over the world and across different types of organizations. So very overwhelming, very humbling. So thanks for this platform. And I hope that uh, all of you have learned something new that you can put to use in your organizations in the next one hour. Um, so before I start with the slides, I want to share a quick short story uh, about my why. Right? So Professor Suman talked about branding and he said, start with your why. Why am I doing this? Right. So uh, this was in 2005 when I was... Um, at IMA, uh, my second year and coming towards the end of the year and all of us are kind of trying to figure out which sector to join in, you know, what kind of a job. And most people are thinking consulting or investment banking or uh, finance or various other options. And I was confused. I was extremely confused. I didn't know what to do, what area to work in. Uh, and I still remember there was this Beatles song called Nowhere Man. And that used to be playing on loop in my mind that, you know, where am I? What do I need to do? What do I want to do? And um, at that time, I vividly remember there was an interaction that happened at IMA in one of the classrooms run by a certain Mr. Aditya Nataraj. Uh, so many of you might have heard of or know Aditya. Uh, he was running Pratham's Gujarat operations then. He later went on to found Kaivalya Education. Um, and I, I think now he's uh, with uh, Piramal. But what I remember from that interaction is how genuine, how nice, how friendly he was. And he was, you know, talking about the work that Pratham does. And that like rang a bell in my head, like, oh my God, I wish this is something that I could do. This is the one area where I could work in. And uh, for a brief, I would say a few days, I actually thought about taking the job, leaving everything. And um, somehow I think God doesn't give us that kind. I mean, I didn't have that kind of courage to leave everything, you know, I, I, I did my CA and then MBA and then you know, leave everything and then do this. I didn't have the courage back then. So I joined a consulting firm in the infrastructure space. Uh, seven years spent there, learned a lot, great fun, very, very valuable. But then this Kida was always there at the back of the head, right? And during those seven years, my only involvement in the social sector was basically, you know, fund or whatever initiatives that I could. But then uh, finally, this seed that had been planted by uh, Aditya, you know, emerged in 2011 when I actually joined a social enterprise called Beable. Uh, so Beable, I don't know if some of them, some Beable folks are here. Uh, very, very close friendships. I, I was there for three years. I was working in uh, skill development for, for the youth. And we did some work in terms of, you know, making uh, youth more employable and then giving them jobs. I was doing some work on placements and partnerships, etc. And very formative years, three years, uh, made some friends for life. You're sensing a but that's coming. There is a but. <laughs> the but is that I realized that uh, while this was, you know, you know, I, I think great in terms of the work, but I was struggling personally from an ability point of view. I realized that to really succeed in the sector, you need two skill sets. Uh, if you want to scale, if you want to do it, things that scale. One skill set is to ability to work with government, and the second skill set is the comfort with operations to manage a lot of operations, logistics, etc. Both of those are my weak points. That's something I realized. Now, I knew my weak points. I didn't really know my strong points yet. So I left Be Able at about 2014 and then uh, tried my hand in a couple of things. I started a history storytelling startup. Uh, that didn't work out too well. But from there, I pivoted into saying storytelling as an area is something that I am fascinated with. And it doesn't matter if it's history or accounts or business. I'm interested in knowing how can people get better outcomes at work through the power of stories. And that's been my life since then for the last four, four and a half years. I've been working with organizations of all types in helping them become better through the power of storytelling. 
And so now when I work with social organizations, this is something closer to my heart because now when I work, I'm working from a position of comfort, of ability, of, dare I say, expertise. Right? So I, I'm really happy now to be engaged with social organizations like CRI, like uh, uh, Leadership for Equity, and of course, ISDM in, uh, in helping people become, you know, deliver better outcomes through the power of storytelling. So that's my story. That's the reason why I'm here. And thank you to ISDM for this opportunity. Uh, with that, let's begin. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you can all see my screen here. In case there are any issues, please let me know. Right. So we're going to look at a very vast topic in a very short amount of time. So please bear with me. Uh, I'm going to uh, you know, cover this in three questions, right? One, what do I mean by the word storytelling? And it's got a different connotation than what most of you might be thinking of. Two, why is storytelling powerful? in any sector, but especially in the social sector. Three, the how. How do you actually use some of these techniques to make something work for you in your work? Great, let's begin. So now, all of you are communicating all the time. You're trying to persuade your uh, users, which are your beneficiaries, your donors uh, or investors, your employees, and society at large. Uh, you're communicating all the time. But the challenge is when you communicate, there are barriers people don't always get convinced by what you say. Most of the time, they don't actually. Why? Because of these barriers. And I kind of classify these barriers into these four buckets, right? And I'm a consultant, so I love classifying and structuring and bucketing, and it just helps me break down a problem better. So what are these four buckets? The one first bucket that I feel where people falter when you're trying to explain them something is just plain confusion or lack of clarity. You might be explaining something very complex, and the audience or the other person is saying, I don't even know what you're saying. What does that slide mean again? That's confusion, lack of clarity. Sometimes you may not be having a lack of you know, uh, clarity, but a lack of engagement where people are saying, yeah, right, we've heard this. A lot of people make the same statement, make the same claim. Boring, not interested. Okay, so that's also a problem that you will have to tackle, especially given you know, attention spans are not very high. The third barrier for me is, okay, you know, you, what you're saying makes sense and I'm engaged, but I don't trust the idea. I don't think this idea will work. We have tried this before. In this organization, it does not work. So sometimes people have this, you know, problem with some ideas. So that could be a barrier. The fourth is, okay, you know, I get you, I'm engaged. I think the idea will work, but I don't trust you, you as a person. And this goes to a very core of thing, you know, your, your trust, your ethos. Uh, many times people don't say this out aloud, but it's probably there at the back of their mind. So these are four barriers, right? That, that are there when you're trying to, to persuade somebody. How do you beat those barriers? By ensuring that, you know, whatever is a problem is removed. So if you are having a problem of confusion, beat it with clarity. Clarity by having the right messages, the right narrative, the right visuals and the right delivery. And so there are a bunch of tools around clarity. Disengagement, engage them. Give them uh, an engaging story structure. Tell them human stories. Use story tools. All of those ensure that you know people who are otherwise disengaged and not paying attention will do so. Don't believe the idea. Use persuasion tools to make the idea more believable. Don't believe or trust you. Use your personal brand or ethos, your relationship, to make your point more forceful. <sighs> so a lot of areas that are there. Uh, the reason why I'm showing you all of this is to tell you that storytelling is a vast area, right? And, you know, this is not something new. This has been discovered 2,300 years back by a certain Greek rock star called Aristotle. And he kind of classified them as three, saying there is logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos is your logic, the underlying, uh, you know, facts, data, numbers, etc. Pathos is the emotional element. Ethos is your trust or credibility. Um, all of these for me are storytelling tools. Now, why am I showing you all of this? Obviously, I'm not going to be covering all of this. But just to tell you that, you know, this is a vast area. So um, we are calling this storytelling techniques, but don't think this is all storytelling techniques. It'll take a, an era. You know, I, in my lifetime, I won't be able to study all storytelling techniques. But what I'm going to try and do in the next 50 minutes is try and give you a quick sense of some techniques that you can use. And I've used examples from the social sector so that it becomes relatable to you. Um, before we go into the techniques though, I want to take a quick quiz to understand the why. Why is storytelling powerful? So I'm going to give you guys a set of questions. 
think of these as KBC style questions. So this is going to come to you as a poll. And the, the important thing is do not go and search on Google. Do not take a book. Just answer what is the first thing that comes to mind. All right. So I'm going to request Adil to pull up the first question, uh, which is this. So you've got these four options. Trigonometry. In trigonometry, what is the sign of an angle? Is it the adjacent side by the hypotenuse, the opposite by the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse by the opposite, or the adjacent by the opposite? I'm sorry for inflicting this torture and this traumatic memories on you guys, but I want an answer. Quick. Adil, once you have about 50, 60, 70% answers, we are good. Uh, we are slightly short of time, so I'm going to push ahead. Let's see how many people are able to answer this right. Please do not Google, do not search. How many answers have you got, Adil? 350 and I've stopped the poll. Okay, perfect. Can we have a look at the... Yes, I'll just share the results. Aha. So it's... Uh, I, I hope everybody can see the answer. Right? So it's uh, split between adjacent and opposite. Um, and then there, there are some answers for the others also. Uh, yeah, we could just be throwing darts, right? There's no way for us to remember this stuff. It's tough. Uh, for those of you who want to know the answer, it is opposite by our partners. Not that it matters to us in life. All right, maybe math was a tough uh, problem for some of you guys. Let's move to a different subject, history. Okay, Adil, can we have poll number two, please? Yes, sir. Question number two. In which year did the second battle of Panipat happen? Was it 1526? Was it 1571? Was it 1556 or 1632? Okay, if you've got about half of the answers, we are good enough, uh, Adil. Let's uh, see the answers. Our voters are getting quicker. Nice. <laughs> They're probably like, kya farak hai? Kuch so do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see the answers. Yeah, so Lalita is saying my color code is that of KBC, right? Okay, not bad. 40% is for 1556. If this was an audience poll on KBC, the audience would be right. So well done audience. I hope you are not uh, using Google to cheat on the side. Or 1556 is the answer, but you can see it's all over the place, right? You know, there's 12% for 1526, 31% for 1571. Again, it's difficult to know these numbers. Okay, last question of the quiz. Adil, if you can bring up the last poll, please. Sure. Here is the last question, guys. In the story, the hare and the tortoise, what is the lesson? What is the moral of that story? Is it A, tortoises are faster than hares. B, well begun is half done. C, it's important to take frequent breaks uh, when you're taking a race. Or D, slow and steady wins the race. Let's see what the answers come up for this one. <laughs> Pallavi saying, thank God for anonymity in the polls. <laughs> Okay, let's see the answers. Oh my God, 96% for one option, which is slow and steady win series. I love, I really want to meet those people who think well begun is half done. It's important to take frequent breaks. Why not? Yeah, of course, <laughs> all of these are important. But what is happening here? Why is it that 96% of the audience could remember a lesson from an obscure story that you may have heard once or twice in your life many, many years back? As against that, imagine how many hours, days we have wasted, sorry, practiced all those trigonometry sums. Why? The reason is that stories are memorable. If you can include stories in your pitch, in your conversation, in your presentation, 
or having a much higher chance that the audience will remember it. We do not remember facts. We forget them like this, right? So that's the big power that stories have. Uh, number one, which is they are memorable. There is another superpower that stories have. To talk about the second superpower, I'm going to talk about something that we are all facing when we talk to audiences, which is the problem of attention deficit. Generally, attention spans were low. And then you've got this problem of, you know, devices and apps and notifications, and we are constantly being bombarded. So they did a study by Microsoft in Canada on the average human attention span. Can you guys take a guess at it? And there's no poll. I just want you to write some of the numbers in the chat box. How many minutes do you think is the average human attention span? Five minutes, 13 seconds, 40 minutes, 45, uh, 20, 20, 20. Okay. Uh, oh my God. I'm, I'm struggling to kind of take a stock, but most of the answers are in various minutes, but there are some of you who know the study. And uh, so it's not going to be coming as a surprise to you that the answer is not in minutes. It was a trick question. The answer is seconds, eight seconds as per that study. So clearly it was done in a certain context, but the point is attention spans are low and they are falling. So which means that you need to be careful. You can't expect your audience to be completely engaged whenever you're telling them something, right? Uh, whenever you're giving them a presentation. But now let's say you have to make a presentation to an audience and forget about, you know, Zoom. Let's say it's a face-to-face -face presentation. Um, how many minutes you think you can hold their attention? How long do you think you can hold your audience's attention? And please don't say eight seconds. It's kind of difficult to book meeting rooms for eight seconds long. So, okay, Gauri says three minutes, 10 minutes, 15, five to 10, three, 20 to 30, 15, 20. Somebody says, depends upon the topic, he must be a consultant. All right, so we've got an average, I think, of 15 minutes. Great. What if I tell you guys, you have all attended presentations in your life where your attention has been held for up to three hours, sometimes edge of the seat. What presentation am I talking about here, guys? Movies, yes. You're talking about movies. A movie is finally a presentation. You're seeing something on a big screen and uh, you're watching something and sometimes it's so good that you know you're engrossed for the entire duration and you're incredibly attentive so movies have a lot of things going for them you've got great music cinematography acting direction but what's the core ingredient that really holds your attention in a good movie what do you think guys the plot, the story, excellent. All of you are getting it right. It's the story which really holds your attention. So that is the second superpower of a story. First, as we said, it's memorable. Second is that it holds our attention in a time and age when attention spans are uh, low and falling. Right. So that's the two big superpowers of why stories are powerful tools, which is why you should include them in uh, your presentations, in your conversations. Great. Now we've talked about the why story. Now let's come to the how. So when I talked about the how, um, I'm going to talk about two types of stories, human stories and number or data stories. Uh, I'm aware time is going to be a little crunched, but we'll try and cover as much as we can. Let's start with human stories first, right? And the universal question that people have is what is more powerful? Should I wow my audience with numbers and data or should I tell them the story of individual beneficiaries, right? So both, both are important. So uh, the best answer to this was found in a study done by Carnegie Mellon University. And it is called as the Rokia study. It's one of the most famous studies in this space. Many of you may have heard of it. Let me quickly replay what it was about, right? It was a experiment where they basically got a bunch of graduate students, gave them $5 each, and then brought them into two groups. Group A, got this. They got a quick paragraph on uh, problems in Africa, right? A lot of data and stats and numbers on problems in Africa. And you can see a bunch of stats there, right? You know, a Malawi food shortage is affecting 3 million uh, children. Um, 3 million Zambians face hunger. 4 million Angolans. More than 11 people in... Whew, okay, overwhelming. Uh, there's a big problem in Africa. Okay, so this is one group. Group 2 got a different conversation, a different communication. This is what they got. They didn't get any data, no numbers, no facts. Story of one individual called Rokia, one seven-year-old girl who lives in Mali, uh, desperately poor, with your support, save your children, will help with Rokia's family and educate her and 
you're not talking any numbers, no millions, you're nothing, right? So now these two stories were told to these two groups. And now what happened? Now you have $5. Each student can decide to donate all $5, zero or whatever amount, right? So they averaged the donations by group A and that amount was $1.14. So in group A, students average a donation was $1.14. Group B, what do you think? Is the number lower or higher? And two, higher by 5%, 10%, 15%, how much? Higher by 50%, higher by 100%, higher by 2x, 50, 200, 20, 15%. Great, you guys know this, right? So you know that where, which direction this is going to head in. Uh, you're right, this number was higher. It was higher by 2x. Yes, it was a big, big jump. $2.38 was what was given for this story. Stories are powerful. We cannot grapple with data and stats. It doesn't make us give, at least as per this study. Right? So this study has not been like replicated on a much larger audience. So you know, we take some of these with a pinch of salt. But uh, in this particular study, it definitely worked that way. And you know, all of us also have gone through these situations, right? When, when we know the story of an individual person, we are, it connects with our emotions because this will not connect with your emotions. Emotions is, is, is stronger in B. Now, does not mean that, you know, you should never use A, you should only use B and all of it. We'll come to some examples of where will you use A, where will you use B. But in this case, B worked better. And there's a nice quote by uh, Mother Teresa uh, in this fact. Uh, and this is her quote, which is that if I look at the mass, I will never act. I feel paralyzed almost. If I look at the one, I will. Because it's almost like I can do something for the one. I can't do something for millions. Right, so that's that's the theory, that's the underlying principle behind it. Now, are social organizations doing it? Yes, almost every social organization knows this. I will use the word almost here. Not everybody, I have looked at a bunch of websites. Not everybody has a collection of these stories, but many organizations have. So what I've done as a part of you know this webinar is to study these guys. How are they you know showing these stories? There's a huge variability. So I've looked at organizations like Goonj, Charity Water, Akshay Patra, Concern India, Keto, and a bunch of others. And I've tried to kind of decode or analyze how are they writing these stories and how you can write these stories better. So unfortunately, my analysis is not backed up by hard research and uh, you know a study. Ideally, we should do like an RCT, right? Where you kind of do all of these stories and then see which one works. Uh, maybe that's an interesting project there for ISDM. Uh, but for now, this is more my um, take on what stories I think work better. So let's try and analyze these stories on this continuum. So I've kind of you know put these on this continuum uh, where I start with the first organization, which is Keto. Many of you would have heard of or would know Keto. It's a fundraising platform. Many people kind of you know go there to, to raise funds for various causes. Uh, I happen to donate to Keto and you know, they are fairly aggressive in their advertisement. So I don't know how many of you are seeing ads like this on YouTube. Uh, it's, you know, it's quite prevalent for me. Uh, yeah. So maybe I can see some yeses all the time. So good. So I'm not the only one. So they are fairly aggressive. Now let's look at this ad, right? I didn't, I'm not actually playing the whole ad, but you know this ad. So they'll have a story. It's always an individual story. It's not data and stats. And they will write uh, statements like these. Uh, um, now, I'm not going to judge this for now, but I'm going to come back and ask you guys, I want you to you know, quickly try and tell me on the chat, what do you think works in this approach, this Keto approach? What is the positive part of the story? Can you guys take a stab at it, please, in the chat box? Emotions, very good, Kiran. Guilt, high reach, emotions, empathy, constant reminder, Emotional connection, impact, guilt, faces, connection, relatable, anger, uh, togetherness, stories about people, ground story, personalized, excellent. This is superb guys, you know, I'm, I'm again overwhelmed, but I'm a little cognizant of time, so I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, so for me, what works is yes, you're right, these emotions are there. It evokes sympathy, uh, which is something which is, I would say it's a great thing. It also gives you immediacy or urgency. It tells you that, you know, if you don't donate in the next 
whatever, you know, immediate short time, there is a repercussion, there is going to be a negative consequence. And that's something that definitely works. It also is very specific in the use of funds. You are not, you know, uh, donating to a fund where you don't know where it will go. You very clearly know it is going to go to that kid Anusha. Great. So the things that work, what are the things according to me that don't work here? I think there is outcome uncertainty. I don't know whether this will actually help in solving the problem. You know, the poor girl may not live even after I donate. So that's one um, uncertainty. The second is it appeals to guilt and pity, right? So now guilt and pity are powerful emotions. But I think that after a point, we become inured to them. If you're constantly saying the same thing as a barrage of the same messages, then after a point, you know, it almost just like water off a duck's back. It doesn't move me anymore. So if you're going to be doing this strategy, then you need to be constantly using this for new and new and new donors because it's after a point, the same donor will say, yeah, I can't do this. Right. So that's my take. I, I don't know. So that's one challenge. And then there's also this, you know, sense of, Oh my God, there's so many more people. This is too much. I can't do this. So those are things for me that did not work in the ghetto story. Uh, but it does work in this situation where you have like an emergency requirement and it needs immediate funding. Yeah, and Kiran is saying, I don't feel good seeing this. I agree, uh, you know. So what are some feel good stories? So let's talk about a feel good story. So this I've looked at an organization called Concern India. Um, and uh, Concern India, I did not know about it, but I was told about um, from, a, uh, from a collaborator, we'll talk about that. Uh, and let's see what is the story that they share. Right? So I'm going to go into their website uh, and then we'll try and see what that story is. So let's look at the Concern India website. It's here. All right. So this is Concern India, right? So they have got a sec section called success stories. And the first story is about a woman called 25 year old Lakshmi Devi, artisan in Sanwada village, Padmir, Rajasthan. Lives with her husband. This is a skill upgradation uh, course that they have done. And I'm not going to talk about too much detail, but essentially uh, after the training, she has learned new ways of doing her craft, has better knowledge of designs. So there is a before and after, and then you kind of have a clear impact at the end. Earlier, she used to use 200 per day. Now it's uh, 200 per month. Oh my God, crazy. And now it's 1800 per month. So, you know, it's still low, but it's much better than what she used to earn. Right. So, so that's a different story. That's one story. Let's come back now. What do you think works in this instance, in the Concern India instance? Evokes hope. Very good. Smiling faces makes me, it's a positive. You can clearly see the impact. Very good. Showing actual change. It's a positive story. Great. Excellent. There's a before after. That's very good. Right. So it's positive emotions as against the negative emotions of guilt and pity. And you get confidence of the outcome. You can clearly see the before and after. Right. So that that's powerful. That's very good. Wonderful. What's missing? Um, what to me is missing in the story is at the end of the story, I still don't know who is Lakshmi Devi. I know she's 25 year old, has a husband, has kids, is in Barmer, but who is she? Can you make Lakshmi Devi relatable to me? So that's the missing part for me. Right? So the lack of relatability, there's also a lack of struggle. It's almost like, you know, if there was a problem, uh, you know, Concern India came in, boom, done, over. Where is the struggle? You know, there's no conflict that is shown here. And so I'm going to next talk about the higher level storytelling. And for me, in India, of the organizations that I've seen, probably the best one that I've seen is Akshay Patra in terms of the storytelling. And again, credit to uh, uh, Kanchan Hans, I think, from uh, Cry, Kanchan Hans, who gave me these two as examples of good storytelling. She got it from some friends of us. So thank you guys uh, for, the, for the referral. Uh, so Akshay Patra is, I think, uh, powerful in its storytelling. So let's look at how they are doing it. They have got an interesting page called Stories of Children and Stories of Teachers. They have a lot of stories, guys. So they have got, uh, you know, this page is about 12 stories. There's one, two, three, next, there are 10 such pages. So 120 stories, that's a lot. Let's look at one such story, right? So the first story I'm going to talk to you about is of this girl called Shravani. Um, so it's got my grandfather's dream. I want to become a teacher is what she says. So let's look at this. So there's a bit of initial piece of saying, you know, education is uh, filling of, a, it's not filling of a pail, it's lighting of a fire. 
let's talk, understand Shravani, right? So she's a student of ninth standard in Telangana. She never showed much interest in co-curricular. Whenever that's free time, she'll be reading books. She has great interest in reading and increasing general knowledge. Okay, then it becomes interesting. It all started when she was a little child. She would always stand and scribble on the walls, uh, teach her grandfather. She, as a child, she would teach her grandfather like he was her only student. She was very dedicated towards making him a good student. The funny part is, we're talking about funny parts in stories about children uh, who are, you know, who are, who are recipients of Akshay Patra. She would reprimand him for not neatly writing in his books. He always wanted to see her grow up to be a school teacher. Isn't that so much nicer to read about? You know, it is uh, clearly Shravani has challenges in her life, but they're not focusing on the challenges. They're talking about a positive take on this little girl who wants to grow up and become a teacher. And then, of course, it's not, you know, de de devoid of the talk of Akshay Patra. Uh, they then talk about saying that, you know, there's something else that she gives credit to. She talk gives credit to her teachers and to Akshay Patra because she's been eating the midday meals for the last four years, she likes it very much. Uh, it energizes her and keeps her mind very active. So clearly, there is a talk of Akshay Patra, which is great. But I like this story. Uh, why? Uh, and I, I'm sorry, guys, I'm kind of rushing a little because you know we are a little short of time. Uh, and I'm sure you guys, it is a little long, Malvika, that is true, but you hear the beneficiary, right? I think it's got C, which has got positive emotions, outcome, confidence. It's got relatability because now I can see Shravani. And there are, you know, many such stories. In each story, they have an element of relatability. In Mahesh's story, he wants to be in the headlines and they talk about, you know, what he wants to become, etc. Um, they induce what I call as this bittersweet emotion. And it's not just pity, it's pride. That, you know, don't pity these guys. They are, they, they are not, you know, asking for your sympathy. They're asking for your help because they want to achieve something uh, with their own hard work. Right? So... Uh, I call this sometimes as a Raju Hirani style because Raju Hirani is a master at uh, using some of these emotions. Uh, I'm going to take a small example from one of his movies. Some of you may have seen this movie called Lage Raho Munna Bhai. And in that, uh, there is a scene where there's this old guy who is kind of um, um, given away by his son and asked to um, you know, enroll in a senior citizen home. It's called Second Innings uh, House. So he goes and he's completely, you know, drooping shoulders, very dukhi life. And he's like, you know, my son left me in the blah, 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 blah. And that's the pity and the guilt. And then he immediately turn it with all of these other people in the house. And then saying that, you know, hey, what, what is wrong with you? you know, forget about what happened in the past. Rejoice in, in this is your second innings, you know, learn something new. And, you know, one of these guys is I want to marry in life. And so this guy's like, really, can you do that? And this guy, you know, makes a naughty comment. And this guy is completely laughing, right? So immediately in that one scene, they change the mood from sympathy, pity, uh, almost tears to laughter. Uh, so Raju Virani is a master. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, you should try and become as good at that, but that is the, the power of positive emotions, even in a difficult context. So if you can try and do that, which is what kind of Akshay Patra is trying to do here, that's powerful. So that to me is, is on a higher plane. What is Akshay Patra missing? Is it missing something? What for me, the small missing element is the element of conflict, the struggle. Sure, I'm seeing that, you know, Shravani wants to become a teacher, but you know, where is the struggle? And can I see her actually achieving something? So now I'm going to introduce to you story number four, which to me kind of meets all the boxes, right? So what are all the boxes for me? So let's look at story number four. Sorry, we'll go back here. Story number four is by an organization called Charity Water. Some of you may have heard of this organization. It's by a guy called Scott Harrison, Harrison uh, headquartered, in the, headquartered in the US, uh, New York. And um, they basically supply clean drinking water to people across the world. And they are very focused on storytelling. So they've got a bunch of uh, stories on the website. Let's have a look at their website. There's somebody calling them the gold standard of storytelling. That's a good description. So they've got this, um, you know, page called stories where uh, there are stories from all around the world. You know, each country has a set of stories and uh, I've kind of, you know, picked up one such story. It's of a story of a guy called Asharfi. So Asharfi is uh, based in UP in India and, uh, you know, it's small minor things, guys, you know, just look at the cleanliness of this site, right? It's so simple and clean to read. 
so those are some things that you know i know it's i'm nitpicking here but it's a little too overwhelming when i see the site with so many other clutter right so these are some things that you know if i wish uh, we could we could you know work on some of these also but okay coming back so this story is a bit long i'm not going to read the whole story but i'm going to just give you the gist and some elements that are interesting right so they do a lot of context setting before <coughs> charity water even comes into the picture and the context setting is what was the problem that ashar fila not charity water ashar fila he is the hero of the story not you your beneficiary is the hero what is the problem he is trying to solve so he is in up poorest districts his area is a dry one but in 1981 his government decided to change that in 10 years thousands of wells were installed great by the way when they say wells it's uh, hand pumps but later the wells started failing and the government responded by creating repair teams so ashar he remembers when he came across one of them for the first time and there's a dialogue from him it's not a uh, you know uh, writing but his actual dialogue verbatim i was curious i had following the mechanics i stacked along what i observed i quite liked he was just 16 years old so they are showing how curious he was then he went home and he made the tools they're showing how resourceful he was he practiced on his own time repaired his own hand pump then he called a government official and said can you come see what i have done the official was shocked when he saw clean water gushing and offered him a job before long however he got restless working for the government so basically now they are showing that you know he was wanting to help but he was bored with you know the slow pace of work with the government he wanted to go faster be more efficient so he started his own business so basically it's a journey of his life and finally they say he was constantly busy doing this had a steady income stream but he knew it was not good enough if he wanted to grow he needed venture capital and early last year he got it so basically finally they nailed down the problem for ashar fee which is money to expand his business right so let me go back now and talk about what was working here what worked here for me was all of these elements plus clear conflict and resolution stories are nothing without conflict and resolution ultimately a story is about you telling how somebody has solved a problem or is going to solve a problem problem is conflict solution is resolution so you need to have both of them as a key uh, part of your uh, storytelling um so uh, some of you are saying audio is not clear is it okay now guys yes okay great i'm going to go ahead wonderful so uh, some of you are also saying that you know these are short stories simple paragraphs all of those elements are definitely there so writing a good story lot of skills going to it uh, but these are some of the critical elements that you can look at <clears throat> what doesn't work here very little guys this is a good story uh, i'm nitpicking all i'm going to talk about is you know maybe a little bit of personal impression of the storyteller could have come in maybe some humor but otherwise this is great So what I'm going to do now is to take the charity water story and break it down into seven key questions. So I'm going to give you like a toolkit or a framework that you can use when you are writing your story. What are these seven questions? Start with who. Who is the person, the protagonist, your beneficiary? Is it a student? Is it a teacher? Is it a farmer? Is it a um, um, uh, a dog? I don't know. So it could be anybody who is your beneficiary, right? So introduce that protagonist. with characteristics now those characteristics need to be vivid i need to see them relatable i can connect with that person and relevant you know i could tell you for example asharfi lal is uh, married with five kids that's not really relevant it's more relevant to say he is curious restless and enterprising those characteristics tell me hey if i actually give money to help him it will actually be used right so those are the powerful characteristics that you should tell but in the form of showing through incidents don't tell me he is curious show me an incident where he displayed curiosity don't tell me that a kid is mischievous narrate an incident where you can see that he is mischievous this is incredibly important stories need to be visual you can't just tell you need to show okay, that's the who connected with the who is the when and where this is hygiene you need to know where the story is happening when is it happening is happening in rural up 1980s to the present day so both of these the who and the when and the where for me are the context in which the story is happening great then we come to the what goal what is the problem the hero is trying to solve um in this case it's scaling up his uh, water 
pump repair business. That's the key problem he's trying to solve. That is a conflict. I mean, trying to solve the conflict, there will be problems, there will be obstacles. Why is this goal not attainable? What are the key obstacles? In this case, he doesn't have money. He probably also needs training in higher order skills. He needs some tools. Those are the obstacles. How will he overcome them? In overcoming these obstacles, you need to kind of show what will three actors do? What are, who are the three actors? The hero, which is your beneficiary, you as an organization and the donor. So in this case, what are the three people doing? The hero is bringing his enterprise, his curiosity, his willingness to work hard. All of that is important because I as a donor also need to see that yeah, I should not be you know, spending money and this guy doesn't do anything. He has to show the willingness to actually meet me halfway, put his own fight. So that's the heroes, um, you know, what they're bringing in. Charity Water in this case, of course, is bringing their advanced skill sets, tools, etc., training, and the donor is bringing in money. So this part of the story is how will I uh, counter the challenges that I will face when I'm trying to solve my problem? Good. Last part is the impact. Okay. All of this happened. How did it end? What was the impact it had on the hero and all the other stakeholders? And what's the call to action? What do we want to do at the end of it? So that's how you can end your story. Right. So, so these are seven questions that you can kind of keep more as a checklist guys. Don't think of these questions as saying that, no, Oh my God, now I've got a recipe. Now I can write any story. No, this is more like a you know, quick checklist. Ultimately you have to write your story with your heart and check this to see, have I missed out something? Do I have a clear conflict? Do I have relatable characteristics for my hero? And so on. It will just, you know, give you some sense of what is missing. It's not going to help you to actually write your story. Right. So that's your uh, human stories framework. Uh, we're already quite late, guys. I'm going to take a quick five minutes to cover the next part, which is numbers. How do you show numbers? Uh, some, some of you are saying the audio is gone. Okay. No. Okay. We can see it. Uh, yeah, Ajay, uh, thanks about a disclaimer. I'm a chartered accountant. I never leave disclaimers. Please, I always give disclaimers. So in numbers, I'm going to talk to you about two techniques uh, when you are sharing numbers, right? So let's go back to this story, right? How did we end this? Charity Water repaired one, one, three, four hand pumps. They spent $64,000 doing that program. $64,000, one, one, three, four hand pumps repaired. Somebody will, if you go and tell this to somebody, they will do the math and then say, yeah, 4,500 rupees on every hand pump. That's too expensive. Why did he spend so much? You could have spent or shaved some money on the cost of training. Why did he need to have such expensive trainers? All of that. When you give a number to a donor or to anybody, you need to frame it appropriately. Framing matters a lot in storytelling, right? So don't just tell, yeah, we spent $64,000. People will say, that's too much. How did Charity Water frame this? Let's look at their story. Here's what they say. We invested $64,000 in our mechanics team, blah, blah, blah. Then they say to build 1134 new wells, they repaired wells, huh? they didn't build. If you wanted to build so many wells at an average cost of $5,000 would have been $5.6 million. What did they do there? They didn't tell you 64,000 is high or low. They just compared, contrasted, put it in the frame of what would it have cost you to build all these pumps afresh, $5.6 million. That's a lot of money. Now you're telling me that you could have spent $5.6 million. Instead, we just spent $64,000, 1% and just repaired all of these. Imagine the amount of money that we have saved. Powerful, right? Framing is powerful in storytelling. You need to look for what I call as the right norm, the right comparison to make your number stand out. This is one way to do that. Another interesting way to do the comparison is to look at the benefit. Can some of you try and tell me how will you compare the $64,000 with the benefit of that money? Who is benefiting from it? And you know, how can you monetize that? Lives reached, Surabhi, that's right. So a uh, number of people will drink the water, Jigyasa, excellent. So we've got 1134 hand pumps. We don't know exactly how many people per hand pump. We can take a quick, uh, you know, sense check. Let's say 100 people per hand pump. 100 into 1134, that's 113,000. So what you're telling me is 113,000 people now have access to clean drinking water. That is a cost of just 56 cents 
per person. 40 bucks, that's nothing, right? Suddenly with that number, the 64,000 becomes, you know, affordable. So think of comparisons, think of framing, never contrast with cost, contrast with benefit or value. Never say, this is what I spent on this. I could have spent lower if I had gone for this. No, this is what I spent. This is the value that is generated for my user. When you compare cost with value, then cost will always be low. If it is by the way higher, then you need to relook at your cost, but compare cost with value. All right, so that's my number one tip to you. Number two tip to you on numbers. Even sometimes comparisons are not you know, good enough. So let me take an example of one of the best storytellers. Uh, so this was a situation where the Apple MacBook had been released. The Apple MacBook is one of, at, at the time of release, was one of the lowest, uh, the thinnest uh, laptops ever uh, made. And how thin? It was just uh, 60.68 inches you know, thick or thin, 1.7 centimeters. Okay, fine. And then some people will say, okay, you can compare it with other laptops and say, okay, Acer is similar, uh, Asus is higher. Okay, this is the thinnest, um, whatever, laptop uh, compared to competitors. Fine, but boring. And uh, now some of you know what was done here and some of you are writing in the chat, but to the panelists, can I request other people to, to try and remember how this was communicated? by Steve Jobs when he revealed this on the stage. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, so Alika is saying as thin as a paper. It was not as thin as paper, Alika. Uh, he opened it from an envelope is what Ajinkya is saying. Absolutely. So Steve Jobs was a big showman, right? He didn't say how thin it was. He showed you how thin it was. He said it is as thin, so thin that it can fit inside a money line envelope. Imagine how thin would that be, right? So a relatable picture is far better than uh, comparing it with other competitors or time or whatever. So sometimes when you have these big numbers, you know, we have reached 40,000 people last year, or we have you know, reduced cost by $40 per person. People can't really connect with some of these numbers. You need to make these numbers relatable. So let's try and make one such number relatable. I've got this example from Akshay Patra again. I love that storytelling. So this is from their annual report. And what they tell is that they cover or they reach 1.8 million kids on a daily basis through all their kitchens. Okay, 1.8 million kids, 18 lakh. You can't really put your hands around that number, right? I can compare it again. Last year, we reached only 17 lakh. Okay, fine. Um, but that doesn't help. Okay, so now we're trying to, so like, uh, can you guys try and uh, guess or try and think, how is it that we can make this number stand out? How can I make this number come out alive? How can I make 1.8 million relatable to anybody? So Jigyasa is saying, I fed a village, one fifth of population, population of a state, picture of a village. So one village will not have 1.8 million uh, compared to a country. Yeah, country is great example. 90% um, of the population in trouble, a pie chart, Salil, no, not a pie chart. Uh, learning outcomes, not really, Manika. One in every three, great. So, so there are various ways to do it, right? This is where storytelling becomes creative and you can do it in a very, very different way. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to visualize 1.8 million. So here is one trick that you can do. Feeding Australia. Australia is, I think, more than 1.8 million, but yeah, that's a good, good example. Um, okay. Uh, what is the biggest space that you can think of guys where a lot of people get together at the same time and stadium, very good, a stadium. So think of the biggest stadium in India, Eden gardens, 68,000 people at one go. Nowhere else will you be able to see so many people at one go. Everybody can visualize what an Eden gardens looks like. Now, all you have to do is to try and see how many Eden Gardens have, do they feed on a daily basis. Do the simple math. Um, oh, it's now Motera, some people are saying. Okay, great. So the math in Eden Gardens would be 26 such fully filled stadiums. And don't just say 26. Visualize it. Make them see it. So that's when it becomes, oh my God, 26 Eden Gardens every day? That's crazy. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, all of you have been in situations where people are fed 
what is a situation in your life where you feed a lot of people at one go weddings can be very good and the big fat indian wedding has a lot of guests we all know oh, langar great example so where langars or weddings uh, the big fat indian wedding is where a lot of guests come let's take a wedding which thousand guests you know that's such a big wedding now all of us know what effort it takes you know people line up and you know thousand guests is a lot you know that how many such weddings does akshay patra cater to in a day 1800 such weddings every day imagine the amount of logistics and planning and care that goes into organizing 1800 weddings every day it's crazy right in fact what i would probably do is go and find out which is the biggest wedding planner in india right and find out how many weddings have they planned in a day i'm sure it will be nothing compared to what akshay patra is doing they're doing something crazy they're doing something special if you're doing something crazy doing something special the storytelling has to be special it can't be uh, we just do 1.8 you have to make it alive finally one more example that i have i'm acutely aware i'm you know running short of time is uh, population right so villages are too small uh, a delhi or bombay is too big so i looked at cities by population in india Uh, there is one city which is almost equal to 1.8 million population can anybody guess which city is that pune no pune is much bigger niti raipur kolkata chennai indore is close it's the same state as indore guys it's bhopal yeah bhopal is about 1.8 million so that is also relatable imagine feeding the entire city of bhopal every day okay i'm going to stop with my comparisons now you get the idea right so when you talk about numbers that are too big make it relatable with size as thin as a envelope time as short as you know cooking maggi noodles space as big as motera stadium a wedding banquet a city or money it just cost you as much as a starbucks coffee yeah so try and make these numbers relatable all right so summarizing what we have looked at so far guys uh, human stories and numbers you need to have strategies for both when you are communicating this for human stories think story structure try and make sure that you cover all these questions uh, who is your protagonist make them relatable show them as real people uh, what was their goal why could they not achieve it how did you help them overcome it what is the impact show don't tell make it uh, you know vivid and uh, bitter sweet emotions pride positive emotions according to me are better than the negative ones but it's your take on numbers frame your numbers use the right norm uh, compare value and benefit uh, not with cost and make your numbers relatable make big numbers especially relatable right so so that's it guys uh, those are my takeaways and tips um i'm aware acutely aware that we don't have enough time but i'm willing to stay on for some more time for q and a i'm willing to stay for as long as you want for q and a um before i get into the q and a a quick share of some of the books that have helped me have influenced me as a storytelling coach um and some of you are asking about the presentation this will be uploaded on youtube so you'll be able to see the slides uh, and the entire presentation So all of these books are great, but if I were to give you just two recommendations, uh, I'm going to talk about the last two. Made to Stick is brilliant in terms of storytelling uh, techniques. The next one, Upstream, is a very interesting new book. It's not about storytelling techniques. It's about problem solving at the root cause level. It's a great book for social organizations. Why I'm recommending it to you is the fact that it's actually very very well written also. it uses a lot of these human stories it uses a lot of these principles of making numbers relatable etc so by just reading that book you will you know gain storytelling principles also and a lot of ideas for making your organization more impactful yeah so i am you know going to stop here right now guys uh, let's have some questions and uh, if i refer them away um, and yeah i'm going to some of you are asking my email id i will share that on the chat so that you have that and i'll go back to the books guys uh, please ask any questions to adil sure uh, people please use the q and a tab that you see on the carousel use uh, that tab to ask your questions uh, ravi is able to see that tab as well 
Yeah, and I've got yeah my email ID and numbers here. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna look at some of these questions. Okay, so Arun is saying that uh, in telling this on the subjective story in corporate is not acceptable. They only like objective story in numbers. So that's a great point, Arun. And um, so I am actually going to pull out one of my hidden slides. You know, I was acutely aware of the fact that I don't have enough time. Uh, so what kind of stories do you tell uh, when the person in, is not accepting some of these stories, right? So let me quickly pull that hidden slide for you. So do you do stories or numbers, right? So both of these are important. And there's a very nice study that was done later by the same Carnegie Mellon guys. What they realized is, if you do both in the same, uh, you tell a story and you also put in a lot of the numbers, in that small study, it is a small study, pinch of salt, caveats, disclaimers, everything, donations came down. That's, I was shocked by that. I thought both will work better, but both apparently don't work. So the, the, the recommendation was you need to become bilingual to talk in Hindi. You need to be able to talk numbers to the people who like numbers. You need to be able to talk stories to the people who love stories. Does that make your job easier? Sorry, no. But who said this was an easy job, right? So it's tough. Uh, but you need to kind of know that, you know, where stories will work and use stories where numbers will work. Use that. All right. Let me try and pick up some more questions. Questions coming. Uh, are there some questions that I missed? Uh, there's some questions that have come in in the Q and A tab, Ravi. That that's better. Yeah. Oh, I'm not able to access that for some reason. Is there a way I can access that, Adil? I'm, I'm just forwarding you the questions. Okay. Um, is it because of the share, Adil? Should I stop the share? I think so, yeah. Let me try and just stop the share, guys. One minute. Yeah, okay. So it's there, but I could not see it. Okay. You can, you can see it now, Ravi? I can see it now. Okay, great. So let me try and see if I can see it with the share so that you guys can... Okay, not possible guys, sorry. All right, so let me stop the share. Okay, this is... So, uh, okay, one person is in, how can I map progress of a child in school on his pre and post status in terms of cases? So yeah, pre and post is very important for the numbers and even for stories, right? So look at metrics that matter to you and to the donors and it's very important whenever you're doing any intervention to always have the base metric, the baseline metric. Without that, it's very difficult. So if you look at the Concern India story, right, it was very difficult if you don't know what she was earning before. Without that 200, that 1800 might see what she's only earning 1800, unless you know that 200, you don't know. So you always need to have the baseline metric. Um, what should be the ideal length of a written success story? So written stories, guys, I would say, Try and keep the fact that, you know, people will not read for something. Okay, let me talk about a spoken story. In a spoken story, it should be more than two to three minutes. When we speak, we normally speak at a speed of 150 words per minute. So, which means that 300 to 400 words is what a spoken story should be like. In a written story, maybe because people read faster, maybe you can have a little more. Maybe 700 words, 750 words. That's, I think, a good length that you can have. What's your thought on using infographics for using storytelling? For sure, Gunjan, I think all kinds of visuals are always good. Uh, the only thing I would say in visuals is keep it simple. Uh, make sure that a person doesn't get overwhelmed with too much information. So the Akshay Patra site for me was a little overwhelming, too much information on one go. So keep it simple, that, that kind of, you know, is useful. Um, so Lakshman is asking elements to cover in the story briefly explain. So we talked about these elements. Uh, Essentially, Lakshman, you know, think of it as saying who is the person, what was the problem, and how was it solved? You know, 
in a very, very nutshell, right? So that's the key thing that you need to cover in your story. All the other elements are kind of, you know, part of the thing. Um, a written story versus a video story, what works better? Video does work better, guys. Uh, the only thing is in video, uh, sometimes production values, you know, the, the sound, uh, the background thing, all of those can become distractions. So try and, uh, you know, make a video that is low on distraction and maybe you can alternate between, you know, have some parts of video, some screens, uh, some, you know, you talking into the screen and all of that so that it's not uh, the, the, the things that are happening in the background don't distract you. How do you tell social problems to a kid? Ashwin, great question. Stories. There are a bunch of interesting stories that uh, people write about. I'm going to recommend a set of books by a person called Ashwin Nayak, Dr. Ashwin Nayak. Look him up. He's written a bunch of stories of real social change makers. And these stories are are for children. So you can read them, these stories. Um, what are basic math skills that one would need to add on to the story? I didn't understand that, Angela. I don't know if you can make that clearer. How do you practice to make a story sharper? That's a good question. So practicing is super critical, especially if you have a situation where you're going to be presenting to a lot of people. Please rehearse. Do not assume that, you know, you meet a person and magically the words will come and you know what to say. Um, the more high stakes the event is, the more your preparation should be. So for today's event, for example, I'd made the presentation. I wrote down what I'm going to say. I actually told it aloud to myself like a couple of times and I was fumbling. I was making a lot of mistakes, but that is good because all those mistakes were something that hopefully you didn't see. Of course, you know, even, even then mistakes will get made, but practice. How do you bring about the pathos in a story? Rima, you know, talk about emotions, right? So talk about the emotions and, you know, again, talk about emotions in a aw shucks or a bittersweet way. Uh, what are some of the uh, quirky, interesting, funny things that some of your beneficiaries are, beneficiaries are doing? Uh, what are some of the uh, things that, that make you feel proud? You know, imagine despite having all these issues, this child, this farmer, this person is still putting so much fight. And those, those, are, those are the stories, those are the elements that will evoke the right emotions in your audience. Okay. okay, guys, so uh, Supriya has an interesting question. We work on child sexual abuse, very difficult and challenging to use stories. That uh, is one of the toughest areas for me. And I, I, I don't even think I can, you know, begin to tell you how to, how to make that better. I, I saw this TED talk by um, this lady called Sunita, I think, um, I think Prajwal. It, it's, it's tough. Um, Honestly, I don't have an answer to, to, the, to, to that. I, I think you just have to maybe try and tone it down a bit because it is such a disturbing subject, right? So um, I, I don't know. I, I'll try and, you know, if I come across some something, then I, I'll share it. Uh, let's move, look at some other questions. What are the different patterns of story so you can avoid repetition? That's a great question, Harish. So, um, Story patterns are something that you will see by just studying different types of stories. I would say at the core, every story basically has the same broad arc of saying, you know, there is a hero in a certain context. There is a problem that they, uh, you know, face. They try and solve the problem. They succeed or don't succeed. That's basically the overarching, uh, you know, pattern to every story. But there is this interesting work <coughs> by this guy called Kurt Vonnegut. That's V-O-N-N-E-G-U-T. And he has studied stories across uh, fiction. And he's, I think, identified multiple patterns. And you'll see, you know, there is a Cinderella pattern. There is a uh, Icarus pattern. It's all a little bit theory in storytelling. I don't think you need to worry too much about those. I would say go with your gut. Just read a lot of good stories and you will kind of, you know, be able to watch and observe these patterns on your own. Sita asks, what if you get interrupted in the middle of your story? Hopefully, if you're telling a good story, you won't get interrupted. But be prepared to answer questions. And if you have prepared and practiced well, you should be able to pick up from where you left. Right? So you should be able to tell that better. Um, what else? Well, wasn't there a follow-up to the Carnegie Mellon in that? Yeah. So the follow-up that I read, Lakshmi, to the Carnegie Mellon study was that if you do story plus data both together, then it is not as effective. 
but i would love to see more studies unfortunately i could not find more and that's why i am you know placing this here right uh, in isdm's lab so i think this is a, a great research subject i'm aware of some people who are i think were doing it in tests but i think this is something that we, we should try and understand what kind of stories work in the social space sometimes you need to keep things confidential about a beneficiary how can you still convey it absolutely when you tell a story there is no requirement to reveal right so you can name uh, keep the name confidential the place everything uh, but i think you can still retain enough elements to ensure that the story is still powerful and evocative and conveys the point that you're trying to do so what would be the best strategy to share the stories with government officials sneha that is one of the toughest questions that i think probably have been asked i think ultimately you have to realize that the person in front of you is a government official but is also a person right so you can't tell a person that you have met on day one a brilliant story that you have just concocted right so with government officials i think the ethos part of your story that you have to first get to know the person get to know what kind of a person is he is he a numbers person is he a emotion person and build the ethos with that person and this is not just for government it's for any client right and try and understand that person once you get that wavelength that ethos then you will know that with this person this kind of a story will work with this person this person with another story will not work right so i think that's what i would kind of say don't kind of reveal everything in the first meeting try to get to know them and then have all of these in your pocket have number stories have data stories have um, you know people stories and then figure out your gut will tell you which one will work for a particular uh, person in a particular context what is the time to be taken a particular person to form <coughs> i didn't get that question yeah so donor fatigue is an important one uh, most corporates are so used to seeing the same kind of presentation storytelling styles so i would say do not copy someone else's style be authentic the best stories and that's one thing that i said i was missing i found it slightly missing in the charity water story right because i felt that it was a story about um, you know uh, asharfi ram but it could have been written by anybody finally in your story you need to come out you know how is your interaction with the beneficiary changing you as a person so it has to be kind of sound authentic and genuine and if you try and do that then it should not be a templated story and which is why you know i'm giving you a template but i'm also telling you don't uh, make the template a crutch it's more of a quick checklist you look at it but then you have to finally tell the story from your heart and hopefully if you do that then it will not seem as templated and you know boring and the same old thing great okay so aksha is saying sometimes one has to pitch innovative ideas with existing scenario but there is only qualitative data but not quantitative data to back it up how can one justify it so qualitative is important and what you can tell your audience is that this is our hypothesis you know basically all we are doing as uh, um, social workers is to test various hypotheses that's what uh, um, you know dr uh, abhijit did with, with the whole rct approach right you know you test out a certain hypothesis you tell your donor that we don't have data now but this is our hypothesis and this is how we are going to be gathering data here is our baseline and we'll keep you updated as the data keeps coming in right so if you promise someone that you know this seems promising but we are going to keep sharing the data with you hopefully they will you know go along with you for the ride uh, especially if you can share with them stories of how some of your hypotheses have come uh, positive in the past have come right in the past okay Oh, interesting. Stella Matthew, for writing a story on palliative children, it's not a story with a future. What points can you guide? So, when you have stories which are very uh, grim and probably don't have a positive ending, in the sense of you know, you know, palliative care is is not going to be a happy story. Look for moments. <clears throat> don't look for like you know, at the end of five years, where will this child be? 
you know, maybe you're talking about uh, a visit by a person, right? And every day for that child is a boring thing and nothing happening. Suddenly somebody comes and on that day, describe the moment in all its visual splendor as to how that day was magically different for that child because of that person's visit or something new that he saw or a visit to a zoo or whatever, right? That moment is a win. And those moments are also something that you're trying to create, right? So don't doesn't have to be something big that, you know, this child became magically cured and this person made a lot of money. Just that positive moment of fear can, can also be something that you to talk about. Oh, okay. So Kevin asking a very good question. Any suggestion on how to collect authentic stories from field workers who lack storytelling skills? I completely agree with that as a challenge. It's very difficult to A, find these stories and B, refine and tell them. So you need to have like almost two skill sets that you need to build. So if I were to kind of give you, give all of you a, a small kind of, you know, tip or a, or a suggestion, I would say identify one or two or more if possible people in your organization who would be charged with the task of finding stories. How do you find stories? Through interviews, through calls. You basically keep asking your field workers, tell me the story of people who have benefited. Uh, give me that number. Let me talk to them. Tell me why they have benefited. You need to ask a lot of these stories. Imagine the amount of effort that has gone by the reporter of Charity Water to find Ashurfi Lan's story. He went to 1981, guys. You know, that is the amount of digging that he did. So you need to have people in your organization who are these, you know, storytellers and you know try and identify those who are naturally more adept at it are interviewing at writing and uh, who also like telling these stories and this is a muscle that every organization needs to build and i'm happy to help some of you with kind of building that muscle of course i won't be able to do it individually but you can try and do more such sessions uh, but this is a very critical muscle that you need to build uh, a skill set that you need to build with more people um, so the skill set is to identify find these stories and then once you find and identify them, then use some of these filters to kind of, you know, uh, refine them and then tell them on your website, on your video blogs, wherever. Good, great question, Kevin. Okay, Meeta, Meeta is asking if an organization has multiple stories, is it okay for all stories to follow the same pattern? So that's what, you know, be wary of templates and patterns. Do not treat this as a case study filling exercise. You know, many corporates have this case study exercise. I need you to fill STAR, situation, task, action, result. Don't make this as an exercise like that. Keep that as a skeleton or a checklist, but write it down. And um, hopefully, you know, with each story, you'll realize that you know, there'll be some elements, your voice, your tone will be the same, but the story is different. All right. Okay, guys, these questions are kind of never ending. I'm going to take a few more and then we'll probably, how long can we go? Um, uh, Adil. Uh, sorry, we can take three more questions. Uh, okay. Ravi, three more questions. Yeah. And Kirtana is asking, how do we get to know our audience? In your example, the government official, whether he's a numbers or a stories person. So the, the difficult part about that is, Sankirtana, you will do it by making mistakes. If you tell a lot of, you know, subjective stories to a numbers person, he will, you know, make you stop. So, you know, the next time you'll try and tell the numbers. So it's trial and error basically, right? So you keep trying different ways with experience. You will start becoming better at taking a guess earlier. That's the only thing, but otherwise uh, the, the best thing I would, I would say is be prepared with both. So that if you're meeting somebody for the first time, if one approach is not working, you have the other approach ready. Okay. Won't testimonials work better? Very interesting. So brother, that's a great point. Now testimonials are good and you should have testimonials along with the story. The problem with testimonials, according to me, is that uh, customers are not storytellers. You cannot rely on a customer to tell an evocative, gripping story about their own life. You know, so they will tell nice things about you. What I would do is keep testimonials, keep a separate section with testimonials, but incorporate those testimonials into your story of the customer, which is 
something that probably Ashurfi story missed out on, but you did see that they had quotes from Ashurfi, right? So you should have quotes from your customer and then have those quotes at the end. So for example, even in the Akshay Patra story, they did have some points of, you know, how uh, the children are finding the, the, the food as a good thing. So have some of those. That's one point I would, I would say as a difference between testimonial and the story. How can I use storytelling for teaching soft skills? Can you recommend any good books or websites? So for teaching, uh, I'm just trying to think, are there any good books? Make to Stick is a great book uh, for, it's got, if you look at their website, uh, you'll find some resources on how you can use their principles for teaching well, right? So, so you can use that. Any suggestions for building storytelling skills, courses, etc. Here, I'm working on a course right now. So watch my LinkedIn space. If I once I, once I finish the course, uh, it's going to take some time though. I'll let you know. Uh, in the meanwhile, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I keep sharing tips. The books that I shared, those are powerful. You can use those. I'm going to do the last one. Okay, this is an interesting one. How can you raise funds for a community that is stigmatized by people through stories? Interesting. So what I'm, the way I'm understanding Albin is you're saying that pe some people have been stigmatized by negative stories. So in the storytelling world, we call these as the anti-story. When people have a negative perception about some people, I know, you know, and I'm not going to take Indian examples. I'm going to take examples from the US. And in the US, there is a bunch or community of people who would say that, you know, there's no point in giving handouts to uh, some of the poor because they are lazy. So that's a negative anti-story, right? You cannot break an anti-story with data, numbers, and facts. You have to break anti-stories with real stories. What does that mean? That means real stories of people showing willingness to work hard of the Shravanis of the world, of the Maheshas of the world, of the Asharfi Lals of the world. Right? And those people are there and you have to, you know, dig these stories out, share them with your uh, world. You cannot convert everybody, but slowly it's like erosion. You know, every story will slowly change, hopefully, the mind of your audience. Um, and, um, you know, you keep trying as much as you can. Right? I'm sorry, guys. I think uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm loving all of these questions. It's great. Uh, your enthusiasm to learn about this. Uh, we will try and pick this up maybe later in a different conversation. But uh, for now, can we call it a wrap, Adil? Yes. Uh, I'd really like to thank you, Ravi, for thank having you. such an engaging session. I think it was really thought-provoking. And we could relate to it because these are things we see around us each day. And then when you see the nuts and bolts behind it, it's really empowering and it's almost a revelation so thank you everyone for joining in uh, thank you for your questions uh, i'm sure we were not able to answer all the questions but feel free to engage with us post uh, the webinar by means of email and we would uh, ensure that your questions are answered so uh, once again i would like to request everyone to please stay safe stay at home and uh, do follow us and uh, do keep an eye out for more uh, interesting masterclasses in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, everyone, and good night. Thank you, everyone.